Hey folks, I guess it's my last video before I review the Napoleon's movie. I hope you're all excited about this. But for today, Russia. So Russia, what can I say honestly? Maybe one of the biggest what-if moments in human history. What if Napoleon never launched this campaign there? What was he doing there in the first place? It's the symbol of a guy who wants to fly too close to the sun. Except this time it's more like swimming naked around an iceberg. So let's go! <laughs> Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. In 1807, following his defeat of the Russian army at Friedland, Napoleon had travelled to Tilsit to meet the Russian Emperor Alexander. During their celebrated encounter, the two emperors formed a friendship and made an alliance. And yes, they kissed. And for a couple of days it seemed like they were having a real bromance and everything seemed bright under a blue sky. That's not gonna last. But it was not to last. Over the next five years, relations between France and Russia cooled dramatically. The Russians were irritated by Napoleon's creation of a Duchy of Warsaw in Poland, which they regarded as meddling in their own front yard. Yeah, if your orthodox authoritarian Russia having a Polish state that is Catholic and backed by Napoleon, slash a new kind of order based on the ideas of the French Revolution, you're going to see it very much as a threat to your own safety. They feared it would lead to the return of a fully-fledged Polish state, a traditional thorn in Russia's side. Then there was Napoleon's offer to marry Alexander's sister, Grand Duchess Anna Pavlovna, to cement their alliance. But the Romanovs hated the idea, and after a year of Russian prevarication, Napoleon married Marie-Louise, daughter of the Austrian Emperor, instead. And yet, that did not secure him an alliance with the Habsburgs. Everyone will still see him as a greedy, ambitious upstart, and the Romanov are not going to want to mix their bloodline with that kind of dude. Later that year, Napoleon broke a guarantee made at Tilsit and annexed the Duchy of Oldenburg, ruled by Alexander's sister's father-in-law. Worst of all was the fallout over the continental system, Napoleon's not very effective economic blockade against Britain, designed to cripple his most steadfast enemy. Alexander had agreed to join the continental system at Tilsit, but it was hugely unpopular in Russia and ruinous to her finances during a period of economic crisis. When I guess that Russia starts to consider a battle plan with Napoleon as far as in 1810. Napoleon found out that Russia was flouting the rules of the system and had resumed an illicit trade with Britain. He was furious. With both emperors accusing the other of bad faith, their two countries began preparing for war. Also, Russia raised its exportation tax on wood and they will kind of embargo France on wood. And wood is that Napoleon needs in order to reconstruct his fleet after Trafalgar. The Bulletin of 
of the Grand Armée. And it's not the Bulletin to the Grand Armée. So the Bulletin of the Grand Armée, it's a massive propaganda tool where the campaigns and victories of the Grand Armée and especially of Napoleon are glorified. It's a periodic magazine published by the regime, posted on public walls, and it's a direct medium between Napoleon and the French people. Propaganda. It starts with the Battle of Austerlitz with 30 issues during the whole campaign. Then you have the Jena campaign, 87 bulletins, and for Russia, only 29. At some point, the bulletins just stop appearing on the walls when things got really bad, and then the public started to ask a question what's going on? <laughs> Napoleon knew an invasion of Russia was a massive undertaking, especially as he still had an unfinished war in Spain that was tying down more than 200,000 troops. Nevertheless, in 1811, he began to assemble the largest army Europe had ever seen, around 600,000 men, though less than half of them were French. The rest came from Allied states across Europe, there was a Polish corps from the Duchy of Warsaw, led by Prince Poniatowski, a corps from each of the German kingdoms of Saxony, Westphalia and Bavaria, from the Kingdom of Italy, as well as Swiss, Dutch, Croat, Spanish and Portuguese units scattered throughout the army. There were even contingents from Prussia and Austria, France's recent enemies, now uneasy allies. Some of these Allied troops, such as the Poles and Germans, were as reliable as their French counterparts. Others were very inexperienced, or like the Prussians and Austrians, reluctant to be there at all. There are two ways to look at it. On one hand, it symbolizes Napoleon's hegemony over Europe, but on the other, it shows that the regime is increasingly dependent on its allies. The Grand Armée of Austerlitz is maybe not that grand anymore. This gigantic formation was deployed in three armies. The main force under Napoleon himself, another led by his stepson Eugène, and a third led by his younger brother Jérôme, King of Westphalia. Neither of these two were experienced commanders. Though one would distinguish himself on campaign, the other would not. On their left flank, Marshal Macdonald led 10th Corps with a large Prussian contingent, while the right flank was guarded by General Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps. Another 100,000 troops were in reserve, including Marshal Victor's 9th Corps. Initially, the Russians only had 220,000 men to face this juggernaut. Organized into Barclay de Tolle's 1st Army, Prince Bagration's 2nd Army, and General Tomasov's 3rd Army. They would be outnumbered 2 to 1. But in the run-up to war, Russia scored two crucial diplomatic triumphs. Sweden had been at war with Russia just three years earlier, a conflict which cost her Finland. By a curious turn of events, Sweden was now ruled by Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte. But after Napoleon occupied Swedish Pomerania without warning, a furious Bernadotte promised Russia that Sweden would remain neutral. Bernadotte was last seen in this series at Vairam. After Sweden had been defeated by Russia, the king was in turmoil, so Swedish officials were looking for a charismatic and prestigious man to succeed him, and at the time, what's more charismatic and prestigious than a marshal of the empire. Bernadotte distinguished himself as an influential and more than competent field marshal. But what made it really shine for Sweden was his administrative skills and he was popular for his kind treatment of Swedish prisoners. So, and I'm oversimplifying things here. One day, Bernadotte is quietly at home and there's a knock-knock. It's the crown of Sweden, will you marry me? 
and Bernadotte will be an invaluable asset during the campaign of Russia as he knows Napoleon and he will very wisely make a diplomatic rapprochement with Russia and provide Alexander with invaluable information. Meanwhile, a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire ended Russia's six-year war against its southern rival. These two agreements secured Russia's flanks from any strategic threat and freed up troops to face Napoleon's invasion. On the 24th of June 1812, French troops began crossing the Nyman River into Russian territory. The army was so large, the crossing took five days. Napoleon's plan was to attack north of the impassable Pripet marshes and defeat Barclay's army, while Jerome pinned Bagration in place. French forces would then swing south to trap Bagration. Napoleon expected the campaign to be over in five weeks. But the sheer size of the French army convinced the cautious Barclay that retreat was his only option. Prince Bagration, a much more aggressive commander by instinct, and often Barclay's fierce critic, was forced to agree. And I guess that we are all biased here because we know how the story will end with this, what we see as a genius retreat all the way back to Moscow while scorching the earth. But first, imagine an army of that size falling on your back. Honestly, it's enough to soil your pants. So the decision to retreat slash scorching the earth in these conditions, hey, it appears as simple common sense. And when I say common sense is in a positive way, it's often the best thing to do in life. As they withdrew, they burned villages and crops part of a scorched earth strategy to deny supplies to the enemy. In four days, Napoleon had reached Vilnius, but Barclay was gone. To the south, Jerome failed to pin down Bagration. So when Davout's first corps swung southeast to trap him, he'd already withdrawn to safety. Napoleon's younger brother was out of his depth. Stung by the Emperor's criticism, humiliated when his troops were put under Marshal Davout's command, he resigned his post and returned to Westphalia. The campaign was already beginning to expose serious flaws in Napoleon's plan. Knowing his troops would struggle to live off the land in this impoverished region, he'd organised huge supply depots and transport units to feed the army. But wagons rolled slowly along Russia's bad roads, which were turned to rivers of mud by summer thunderstorms. The army had to This phenomenon is called Rasputitsa. It happens in springs or in autumn when the snow melts or when heavy rains transform roads into a sea of mud. So then wheel breaks, horses are trapped in it, soldiers lose their boots in the thick mud. And it's also what will cripple the Wehrmacht during the early stages of Barbarossa in 1941. To make frequent stops to allow its supplies to catch up. Bad news for Napoleon's plan to catch the Russians, but a much needed relief for the many thousands of young conscripts in his army, not used to hard marches day after day. Many were soon dropping out with exhaustion, others deserted. There were also huge problems of command and control over a vast multinational army that was three times bigger than any Napoleon had commanded before. La Grande Armée, once famed for its speed of manoeuvre, had become a lumbering beast. After a pause to rest and regroup at Vilnius, Napoleon resumed his advance. Barclay continued his retreat to Vitebsk, where he hoped Bagration's second army would be able to join him. But Davout blocked Bagration's path at Soltanovka 
forcing him to make for Smolensk instead. At Vitebsk, Napoleon clashed with Barclay's rearguard, but once more the Russians escaped, after setting fire to all the stores they couldn't take with them. Meanwhile, and Vitebsk in the ground plan of the campaign is where the logistic supply will stop for they won't have the means to go very much further. From there, Napoleon assumed that he was going to enter the richest parts of Russia and there he will rely on local supplies and leave of the land to supply its army. 300 miles away, on Napoleon's southern flank, Russian 3rd Army attacked and defeated the Saxon 7th Corps, forcing Napoleon to divert Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps to their aid. By the end of July, Napoleon had advanced 250 miles into Russia, much further than he'd planned. And the long marches in extreme summer heat continued to take a heavy toll on his men. Without fighting a major battle, the army had already suffered 20% casualties from exhaustion and illness, particularly typhus and dysentery. The army yes, the bigger killer in war is the campaign itself. Soldiers live in precarious sanitary conditions. They eat what they can eat, often spoiled food or food their stomachs cannot digest. You walk in difficult conditions, sleep badly, there is promiscuity between soldiers. All this weakens your body, which is also exposed to diseases to which your body has no immunity. So if you want to destroy an army in the early 19th century, you let it march indefinitely. Army had entered Russia with a quarter of a million horses, but they were now dying at a rate of a thousand every day, from exhaustion and lack of fodder. It wasn't just cavalry horses that were dying, but the very horses that were supposed to haul the army's transport wagons, making a bad situation worse. Yeah, a horse, for example, needs astronomical quantities of hay and horses are needed to transport this hay. This crisis in horsepower came just as the French light cavalry, Napoleon's eyes and ears, met their match in Russia's Cossacks. Cossacks, self-reliant, proud, ruthless and superb horsemen didn't play by the same rules as other European cavalry. Every day they shadowed Napoleon's army, swooping in whenever they saw an easy target, but melting away into the forests if they were attacked by a stronger force. Cossacks, as well as Russian partisans, made hit-and-run attacks on French supply lines and depots, forcing Napoleon to divert thousands of troops to their defence. Alongside Russian regular light cavalry, they also prevented French patrols from carrying out reconnaissance, which meant that Napoleon often lacked good information about roads or the enemy's whereabouts. Cossacks are heirs to Eastern cavalry traditions with very fast horses and harassment tactics to provoke a spontaneous charge that will disrupt the cohesion of their enemy and then Cossacks will destroy you little by little. They have a history that I don't always understand as it is complex and very long. So I try once again to summarize it. They are nomadic, semi-autonomous population groups with a very special status in Russia. They serve the Tsar in many ways. For example, they help very much in the colonization of Siberia. They used to guard the borders. They are very useful to control vast amounts of lands and so on and they will be critical during the retreat of the Grande Armée. Napoleon stayed 16 days at Vitebsk, resting his troops and considering his options. 
Among his many mounting concerns was the security of his long, exposed flanks. But at Vitebsk he received news that Schwarzenberg had defeated the Russians at Gorodezhna. A week later at Polatsk, a French Bavarian force fought Wittgenstein's Russian 1st Corps to a standstill. Napoleon's flanks were secure, for now. Although his main force had been reduced to less than half its original strength, Napoleon decided to push on to Smolensk, and try to force the Russians into a decisive battle for the city. Barclay was indeed under pressure to give battle, from fellow commander Prince Bagration, and Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg. The army's morale, and Russia's honour, required it, they told him. With the first and second Russian armies finally linking up near Smolensk, Barclay decided to attack Napoleon's army, which he believed was concentrated around Rudnya. The offensive was led by General Platov's Cossacks, who surprised a French cavalry division at Inkova. But alarmed by false reports that Eugène's 4th Corps was outflanking him to the north, Barclay called off the attack. Napoleon, reassured that Barclay's offensive posed no real threat, began a grand outflanking move to the south, to take Smolensk and cut off the Russian retreat. The so-called Smolensk manoeuvre was Napoleon at his best, using Murat's cavalry to screen his movements and keep Barclay in the dark. The Emperor reached the Dnipr on the evening of the 13th of August. His engineers quickly threw up four pontoon bridges, and by dawn the next day, his army was across. Marshal Davout led a second column across the river at Orsha. But a single Russian division, the 27th, fought a heroic fighting retreat from Krasny, delaying the French advance, and buying time for Bagration to reinforce the Smolensk garrison. The chance for a surprise assault on the city was lost. And as the Russian army began to pull back, Napoleon displayed an uncharacteristic lack of urgency, even halting the army for a parade to mark his 43rd birthday. That's surprising from Napoleon, for his entire art of war is based on the search of the decisive battle to destroy the enemy. That's the main point of every campaign he's led so far. And his lack of, I might say, ferocity will also be criticized at Borodino, where he will refuse to commit everything especially the Imperial Guard, to destroy the opposing army, but I guess that's a story for another day. When the main attack on Smolensk began two days later, Napoleon opted for a frontal assault. 150 French guns battered the city, as three French corps attacked its medieval fortifications. The Russians resisted bravely. But Barclay, fearing encirclement, ordered another retreat. With Smolensk in flames, the Russians began to pull out. Just as the French fought their way into the city, to scenes of utter devastation. Bagration's second army withdrew first. As Barclay's army followed, its rearguard was caught by Ney's third corps at Valutino. General Junot, commanding the Westphalian 8th Corps, had orders to cut off Barclay's retreat. But having crossed the river, he did nothing, and the opportunity was lost. A furious Napoleon swore that Junot would never now win his marshal's battle. The Battle of Smolensk cost both sides around 10,000 casualties, and destroyed one of Russia's most historic and holy cities. From what I know, there is a holy icon in Smolensk, and part of the plan was to heavily shell the city with cannons to make the Russians fear that this icon would be eventually destroyed, to force them to make a stand out of the city in order to, to 
prevent the relic to, to be destroyed. And that's a pity for Smolens could have served as a supply hub, but now that it's destroyed, not so much. And during this time, so Alexander and Bernadotte meet and they are together when the news of the Russian defeat at the Battle of Smolensk arrived. Bernadotte comforted the Tsar. He told him, yes, he's not, Napoleon is not going to reach St. Petersburg. And he gave him, once again, very valuable information that will very much help the Tsar to win the campaign. And for this invaluable information, I have to thank one very active guy under my video who will recognize himself. Thank you, my friend. But settled nothing. Mm. Part of it is true, part of it is not. After the missed chance to defeat the Russians at Smolensk, Napoleon paused once more to consider his options. His men were weary and far from home, and it was already late in the campaigning season. He considered sitting out the Russian winter at Smolensk and resuming the campaign in 1813. But now he was just 230 miles from Moscow. A century earlier, Peter the Great had moved Russia's capital to St. Petersburg. But Moscow remained its historic and spiritual heart, a prize for which the Russians had to fight. Napoleon, always a gambler, decided to push on. Figures who have a destiny like Napoleon are always gamblers, testing their luck and forcing their destiny. That's often what eventually loses them. And I'm going to make a comparison and I'm going to vomit right after. But yes, it's a point in common between Napoleon and Hitler. And that's it. I've reached the Godwin point on my channel. The Russians faced their own dilemma. Emperor Alexander had experienced a kind of religious epiphany that summer and rallied the Russian people to the country's defence, describing the war with Napoleon as a war to save Holy Mother Russia from the Antichrist. For months, the Emperor had received conflicting advice – to stand and fight or retreat. Now he decided change was needed. The cautious General Barclay kept his job. But the Emperor summoned General Mikhail Kutuzov to take overall command of Russia's armies. Kutuzov had been beaten by Napoleon at Austerlitz seven years before, but he'd since won several victories against the Ottoman Empire and was a true Russian, loved by the troops. Although Kutuzov agreed with Barclay's strategy of delay, he saw that constant retreats were destroying the soldiers' and the nation's morale. Yeah, it's always the endless dilemmas of a warlord. When do I fight or when do I retreat? If I retreat because I cannot find a superior enemy, so I don't defend my territory because that's the strategic thing to do, to live to fight another day. But then how do I maintain the trust of my population? And how do I explain to my soldiers who are also marching and are exhausted that this time we have to fight? If Moscow was given up without a battle, the fallout could be disastrous. And so, 70 miles west of the city, near the village of Borodino, the Russian army prepared to make a stand. Europe was about to witness the bloodiest day's fighting of the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, they know how to hook us, huh? I can't wait for our next part. Till then, yes, I will review the Napoleon movie, so stay tuned. And meanwhile, thank you for watching once again, guys. Let me know what you thought of this video. And talk to you very soon. Bye.